Well, my name is Brian Pollock. Uh, I am a senior uh, support engineer um, and hardware specialist working with, uh, with my colleague here. Uh, we've been, uh, been at this for uh, quite a few years. Um, my name is Bob McGoy. I'm also a senior application engineer at Computer Aid Technology. I'm part of the SOLIDWORKS and the 3D Experience team. Um, been working with Brian for quite a few years on this and also Adrian and Josh who helped start this up many, many years ago. So just looking forward to showing you some good information today. Okay. Uh, first off, uh, we want to talk about some of the hardware that we used. We have uh, some very nice machines. We've been working with uh, a company called Box, uh, Box Technologies, B-O-X-X. -X. Uh, our first machine, uh, aka uh, uh, Maverick, uh, this is a an i7 uh, uh, 4 gigahertz machine that is overclocked up to 5 gigahertz. Uh, so it's running the i7 chip. Uh, we've got uh, 32 gigs of RAM, uh, DDR4, uh, 512 SSD. Uh, we've got a, a, a 240 gig uh, SATA SSD. Uh, we're running Windows 10, um, but then we, uh, we've got a bunch of things that we did to this system uh, as we go on. Yep, so one of the reasons why we, we went with overclocked workstations in this situation was we wanted to be able to control the clock speed. So by doing that, we could see what the maximum impact was, and we'll talk about that later. Second machine we used uh, for us was a, it's a little bit older, uh, Apex II, uh, also from Box. Uh, this one is also an i7 that's overclocked up to 4.8 gigahertz. Um, baseline, we had a 64 gigs of DDR4, uh, 512 SSD, uh, 240 gigs SATA drive. Um, so very, very similar machines, um, and we, we keep them uh, uh, pretty, pretty close through most of our, our testing, but we use them in a couple different ways. Uh, this year, we were very uh, happy to partner with Box and take a look at their new uh, cloud services. Um, so they are working up, uh, spinning up a, uh, a virtual uh, virtual desktop cloud service, um, and this is running an i7, um, eight core, uh, that's overclocked again up to 5.1 gigahertz. Uh, so that's running just as fast as those towers, uh, the physical hardware. 32 gigs of RAM, 512 SSD, M.2. Um, they've got a uh, NVIDIA Quadro RTX 4000 in there, which is a very nice card we'll talk about, um, and they're running the Windows 10. So on our previous two machines, we did not specify which card we put in there because we uh, actually tested it with a, a number of different cards. Uh, speaking of the cards, uh, we uh, uh, first partnered up with uh, our uh, partners at NVIDIA, and they provided us with a, a nice um, box of uh, goodies. So we had everything from uh, the Quadro M2000 uh, all the way up through the P6000. And then uh, last year, right before World, is when they uh, released and introduced the RTX 4000, and they dropped that on us. Um, and we are very happy to uh, run through those results. This year, we added into the mix a partnership with AMD. Uh, NVIDIA and AMD have both been uh, producers of high-end graphics cards for the CAD industry. Um, and uh, we are happy to bring in the AMD line of cards with their W5500, uh, WX9100, WX5100 and the WX3200. So that, uh, and one more there. Yep. Yep. So that, that W5500, um, we were contacted directly by AMD um, because they knew the hardware testing that we had been doing over the years. And they asked us to run tests on this W550 before SOLIDWORKS World because at SOLIDWORKS World, we actually got to announce the release of this video card at our presentation. So we got to share some results from that. 
So there's there's some pretty decent results there, which I, I think are, are pretty pleasing. Um, there are some things I think um, if I was still looking at in, NVIDIA versus AMD, I'd probably still look at NVIDIA pretty heavily, but AMD is getting some very compelling results with some of their new drivers. They're doing a good job of listening to some of the impact that the SOWERS community has on their business. So they're really starting to tailor some of those drivers to what they're doing. Absolutely, and we'll get into that and make more sense when we look at some of those numbers. All right, so that's uh, that kind of sums up what kind of hardware we took a look at. Um, and when you have that many uh, factors coming into play, uh, this is how uh, Bob and I keep our head somewhat uh, wrapped around all the various tests. Um, so we did, we've did we taken looks at everything from uh, clock speeds to the different video card combinations to the types of hard drives. Um, and that's all just the physical hardware. Uh, then we mix into this uh, a host of sour settings that we know uh, can definitely impact the performance of the software. And we want to look at individual settings and see how those uh, react uh, through the test. And on top of that, we had a, uh, um, our models. So we take a range of six different models and uh, of different calibers and uh, run it through the test. So we're not just testing a small data set, uh, we're te testing uh, uh, a wide spectrum of data, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the how we did this testing is, is kind of interesting. We we have a couple of really good programmers on our team. Bob Hansen's one of those. Um, he he helped out with the original concept for this and got this up and running. But what it allows us to do is run a litany of assemblies through a certain number of tests over and over and over again and repeat them. So we test um, using the Sowers' APIs, opens, closes, pack and goes, rebuilds, model edits, inserting components into an assembly, building new parts, all, all the sorts of things that we would need to do on a regular basis as a designer. And the reason why we did this was if any of you have ever run the SOWERS RX tool, you can do a benchmark on it, but it takes seconds in many situations. And there's not really a, any room for mathematical abnormality there or, or throwing out um, bad numbers. In this situation, we're able to take a piece of hardware and run tests on it that might take anywhere from five to an, five minutes to an hour. And you're able to see what's actually mathematical errors and what's actually real results. So that's, that's what we did here with this is benchmark that we, we wrote. Well, another key thing there that uh, we do is we built this so that we can plug in uh, any uh, assembly uh, that we choose. Yep. Yeah, it runs the same operations on any assembly we plug into it. So on the graphics testing side of things, um, there's really no good way of doing graphics testing yet inside of SOLIDWORKS. We're waiting on SOLIDWORKS to open up some API calls for us so we can do some of this. So we had to do some really manual testing. Um, one of those things is if you look at the SOLIDWORKS API, um, if you can tell it to run rotations and things, but it's just going to run the rotations as fast as humanly possible, and then it's going to say how long it took to get those done. Here, we actually are simulating mouse movement. So I took a three, about a three-minute recording of my mouse on a model and actually using a program to play it back so we actually get the exact same mouse movement. So you can see lag, frame rate drop, that sort of thing. So we're looking at different frame rate monitors for graphics testing, and we're also doing a little reg hack there too, just to see different results. So if you ever want to see how many frames and what the current frames per second count is inside of SOLIDWORKS that SOLIDWORKS says it's doing, 
um, you can go into um, registry under HT current user under software, SOLIDWORKS, whatever the current version of SOLIDWORKS you're running under performance, you're going to find a OpenGL print statistics. And by default, it's at zero. If you switch that to one, close the registry key, then reboot SOLIDWORKS at the bottom of your SOLIDWORKS graphical user interface, you will see rebuilds, paints, frames painted, that sort of thing. So that's showing you real time what the graphics card is displaying through SOLIDWORKS. It's not the only part of the story because it's, as from what I've been talking to development over the years, it's not the most accurate tool, that FBS inside SOLIDWORKS, but it is a number. Um, so we were looking to see what the video card was actually seeing, not just SOLIDWORKS. So we used several different tools. We used uh, FPS monitor, fraps, and it actually would paint on top of the OpenGL experience inside of SOLIDWORKS. That's actually a screenshot showing you the number of cores that were running, their speed, um, what my max and min CPU um, or GPU processes were, and my frame rates. So actually quite a bit there painted right on top of SOLIDWORKS with, with I think I used FPS monitor in that situation. I believe so. But uh, yeah, we had some great conversations this year out at that world talking with the developers and the uh, and uh, they were very impressed with what we uh, we have managed to uh, to do. Um, but they uh, they definitely think there's some stuff that uh, needs some work. Um, so we're going to continue to uh, try to to elevate this and uh, get better. Uh, Better and better data as uh, as we go forward. Yeah, but the nice thing is we can definitely looking at the numbers because we're able to reproduce it the same way across multiple video cards. We can give you an idea of what your performance is going to be. All right, so things that uh, we have tested and what affects graphic performance. Obviously, we look at things like graph the card itself. Um, and very importantly, the, the, the driver uh, that you have, we, uh, we ran into our own little nightmares with uh, incorrect drivers on there. Uh, so very important, uh, make sure your driver's up to date. Uh, but CPU, RAM, uh, the size of the assembly, um, complexity of the models, level details, uh, the uh, real view, um, image quality, uh, we took a big look this year at the graphics performance pipeline. If anybody you, uh, have been following us, uh, saw our presentations in the past. Uh, last year, the, uh, the pipeline was introduced uh, as a beta function, um, and it looked very, very intriguing, very good uh, initial performance, but we weren't satisfied with that little small snippet that we did. So we, uh, we blew the doors off and we took a deep look at this um, and found some very interesting uh, information not going on here. Yeah. So uh, all these types of things um, are the things that we want to look at that we know have a graphical impact. Yeah, and at the end of the day, we, we're trying to figure out what aspect of your computer or what aspect of the software is actually causing the bottleneck. So if we can re re alleviate bottlenecks, that's, that's our goal. All right. So that kind of tells you what and how we uh, how we went about our testing. Uh, so let's take a look at what types of models uh, we used. Our first one uh, here is a model from a company called Chipstar. This was actually a support case uh, that I worked on um, and never talked to this customer. It was after one of our mergers and uh, he had an initial problem that said, uh, called in, said he could no longer open up his model. Uh, so I took a, took a look at it, took a stab, got the model open, and I said, oh, look, all right, I fixed this thing for you. By the way, you uh, you fumbled this thing up so good that uh, I want to use this in a presentation. Um, and then he kind of chuckled, and uh, he was gracious enough to uh, to help us out. And uh, it's about 1,500 uh, components. Um, it's about 1,600 bodies, so the number of bodies are actually a little bit higher than just the component count. Um, and we used this one in multiple uh, different ways because uh, we took the original data um, as we received it from the customer. Um, and then I have another presentation where we went through and found 
all the different problematic parts of this uh, assembly, and we clean them up. Uh, so we've got a uh, cleaned up version, and then we've got a, another model where we've uh, really dropped the image quality uh, on top of the cleaned up model, and so we have it in kind of three different stages. Uh, second model we used uh, is our telescope. Uh, this is about 7,500 components, all right, but it's a lot of multi-bodies. Right? So, uh, so we're at about 22,000 bodies in this file. Uh, so we go from about 15, 1,500 components up to 2,200, or 22,000 rather. No, there's no we also structures in that thing. <laughs> <laughs> we also went back and used one of the original models. This uh, this is the Racine Railroad. Uh, this was the model that Josh and Adrian uh, started with back in, uh, what was that, about 2012, 2013, when we, we first started this adventure. Um, and we picked apart this model, built a ton of modeling methodology practices um, that we have uh, preached over the years, and a lot of that was due to this model and all the things that we went through. Uh, this is about 10,000 components um, and gives us about uh, uh, 15,000 bodies. Okay, so just slightly smaller than uh, the telescope. And then we said, well, how do we make that even worse? Well, you double it up, of course. All right, we, we, uh, we identified, we created uh, two train cars in one file. Okay, that, that bumps our count up to uh, about 20,000 components, running that body count up to about 30,000. Okay. And no, that's not two sub-assemblies. They're actually both of the top unique. Level. Yeah, we, we did, uh, we, we, uh, we identified them to be unique components. Um, so it wasn't just dropping two, two in at once. Yeah, so file names changed and everything else, so they actually became unique identifiers inside of SOLIDWORKS. All right, so this year, um, very astonishingly, when we look back at the numbers, we have completed more than 6,500 uh, custom benchmark runs. And that um, we also, that, yeah, that was leading up to World. Uh, we have continued that process. I don't even want to know what that number is right now. Um, and we've done, uh, we did nine different video cards. Uh, so that's 36 RX uh, benchmarks, um, you know, plus some bad runs and retests in there. And we did uh, about 360 uh, custom video benchmark tests. So a lot of lot of data uh, getting crunched through here. So RAM, um, this is one of those people always ask, how much RAM should I stick in the system? And we we usually recommend 32 gig, but basically, you, you think about it when it when it comes to RAM inside of SOLIDWORKS. When you have enough RAM to load your file into RAM, you don't need any more RAM as far as SOLIDWORKS goes. But what we want to take in consideration is on a daily basis, I'm not just running SOLIDWORKS. I'm running SOLIDWORKS. I'm running Teams. I'm running our, both of our CRM tools. I'm running five other things in the background that are probably going to require some RAM. So just because I've got SOLIDWORKS open by itself with nothing else running and 16 gig does it good enough, it may not do well enough for my day-to-day -day driving. So we do recommend at least 32 gig, but if you're running SOLIDWORKS by itself, in the majority of situations, 16 is pretty good. But we'll see, we'll see that with some of the results here. And uh, 2019, the big thing was uh, in 2019, we made the change from the 8 gig minimum requirement to the 16 gig minimum requirement. And, uh, and what we see when we ran these tests, and we varied the amount of RAM, was when the model was large enough, and we were down all the way at the 4 gig, our largest model wouldn't even open. We couldn't even get a data point. Okay? We just physically couldn't do it. So as we increase the amount of RAM, okay, what we're seeing here is that everything converges and starts to flatten out around 16 gig. You say we're flattening the curve, Brian? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, it definitely is around 16 gig for for almost all of those files. So. 
So right. C CPU, we, we did have a question on this one, Brian, is how much are you overclocking? Basically, what is the design clock for the processor? So you can see right here, it's, it's showing the, the specs of the processor for Maverick, which was a baseline of four gigahertz. Um, Box does an amazing job of creating a coolant system that keeps that processor below its normal spec at its baseline clock speed. So if it says it'll work at, at 70 or 80 just fine, Box is usually keeping that processor around 60 with its cooling solution at over an extra gigahertz faster. Yeah, so they have a, uh, a special, there's a special uh, pro, uh, process of certifying chips that can be uh, overclocked. Uh, yep. That's a process that Intel does. That is a secret process. Um, and if, they, if a chip does not pass that test, uh, that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that they will lock that chip um, as a standard uh, processor uh, that cannot be overclocked. Um, so uh, it doesn't get that K at the end of it. Exactly. So, um, so yeah. So we are we are seeing a full gigahertz jump uh, when we were talking about these overclock processors, and we'll talk about why that is significant. So you can see here because of the system being overclocked itself in the BIOS, that opens it up for us to be able to control the clock speed in general. So we went as far down as 2.6 gigahertz and all the way up to 5 gigahertz to see what the performance overall of a single test would be. And we ran multiple tests. This is average average scores here. So you can see um, it's pretty much a linear response in most situ situations. If you're comparing apples to apples, the faster the processor, the, sh the less time it takes to finish the job. Uh, so here's the uh, data in a little uh, little different format. We took a look at uh, uh, fully resolved assembly, uh, no large assembly mode, and uh, basically uh, we're, we're seeing that same drop. All right, so we're seeing a nice steady, steady drop um, as you go up in clock speed. And this this is held true for almost every machine we've ever tested. Um, so what that equates out to is that uh, we are we're seeing approximately 11% faster for each half gigahertz. So that's I'd safely say that's 22 to 25% for every one gigahertz um, increase in your clock speed. And, and we're we're talking base sustained clock speed. If if you're running a laptop and it and it says the base clock speed is 2.8, but you can do what they call a turbo boost of 4.2. That turbo boost is only going to last you for about five seconds. And the reason for that is that clock on that processor is able to get up that, that speed and consume that power. But when you consume power, you create heat. So when the heat hits that upper level on a, on a laptop, it's going to clock back down to the, the 2.8 that you're getting. So if you're looking at laptops, make sure that you're looking at the base speed and not the turbo speed. Yeah, more and more of the turbo speed, yeah, you start getting the throttling. They call it throttling, uh, where the system tries to uh, compensate for the temperature increases. So we don't, just because it can say it can run 4.5, 4.8, on a, a boost doesn't mean that we're going to run that at a steady, solid uh, boost speed uh, for extended periods of time. All right, so this year uh, we took a look at um, looking at our day a little different. We, we've uh, we've used some Power BI function, uh, inserted these models in, and uh, what we see here is that across the board we are seeing um, very uh, uh, similar patterns uh, across our models. We're seeing the spikes in the same area. Um, and uh, so this is taking a look at uh, 
at the six different models uh, overall. And each each one of the the SW zero SW zero one SW zero twos that you see at the bottom are solid settings that we changed. Just one setting change on a machine. So you can see the the first setting setting zero one was actually default settings with large assembly mode disabled. And then you see setting number two, that's with large assembly mode disabled. So now you're loading the full assembly and you can see there's a spike there. You can also see that there's one at zero four. That's when we turned on, I believe that is verification on rebuild. Is that correct, Brian? Uh, yeah, three was lightweight. Yeah, so four, yes, yeah, should be verification, I believe. So you can see it's, it's That's pretty consistent. That's why Bob and I have to go back to our, our cheat sheet quite often. <laughs> yeah. So, but with with over 300,000 data points, Power BI was saving our keys through this year. All right, one of the things we keyed in on here uh, was taking a look, uh, an in-depth look at the graphics performance pipeline. And so not only did we test 14 different settings, we actually doubled that up to 28 different settings because we ran every one of those tests with the pipeline on and the pipeline off. And we took a look at uh, runs of, I mean, we studied everything from 2018, 2019, and 2020. Um, so in this chart here, this is uh, taking a look at graphics pipeline on uh, versus off. The green line is 2020 with the pipeline on. Uh, the red line indicates the pipeline off. And we see that uh, the performance uh, stays, uh, stays right in line. Um, surprisingly, what we're seeing is that the pipeline off actually does run a bit faster. Um, so we had a head scratcher. Uh, we we're thinking that that would, you know, in our head when we talk about what the graphics pipeline does, and let's step back here and actually tell you what it does, because what that does is it's a uh, change to the software OpenGL. They jump from uh, 1.1 to 4.5. Uh, it's a rendering engine that SOLIDWORKS is developing inside the software. And it's allowing them to push more graphical data over to our GPU. So we're actually now utilizing those GPU cards um, a lot more than we've been able to in the past. Yep. So we had a conversation with the head of video cards at SOLIDWORKS, his name's Sid, very nice man. Um, but what, what he found out was now that we've been able to use OpenGL 4.5 and been able to load all the data, we don't have that blockiness anymore. If you if you notice in, when you have the pipeline on, it doesn't do the reduced image quality, it doesn't block things down. Now, it comes up, someone says, I assume that higher numbers are faster times. Actually, no, higher numbers are slower times. So, oh, great. You're larger, larger uh, yeah, it's, larger it's numbers seconds along. It's, it's, it's the number seconds. of seconds to complete. So, you're probably scratching your head. You're, you're, you're looking at the red line, that's pipeline off. It's faster than pipeline on, which is green. And the reason for that is when they went to the new pipeline, they loaded too much data to the video card. So now they're trying to find that balance between performance and loading all the data. So, now, the great thing is, we're looking at 2020 here, the delta in 2019 was even greater. Uh, this one, uh, this chart here is, uh, what do we got here? That's 2020. Uh, the difference of the uh, SSD versus the M.2 SSD. Yep. So again, we're comparing, uh, trying to look whether the M.2 drives performed any different. That was a big, uh, big shell shocker uh, in our presentation last year that we found that those drives actually performed almost identical uh, within uh, one or two percent of each other. Um, so that was something we definitely wanted to take a look at because M.2 drives by nature are seven to 10 times faster than a SATA SSD drive. Yep. And that just didn't make sense. So we wanted to add that into our mix to try to understand 
what was going on there make sure we didn't have a fluke. And that is what we're seeing. Um, we went as far as we, tested too. And when we're back to, here's the 19 numbers, we can see that the delta between these two lines um, gets, gets much greater. All right, and that's where uh, our conversations with Sid and the development team uh, really helps help us to understand that uh, 19, when this was beta, uh, we saw this, we did see a big hit. Uh, 20, they're, they're, uh, they're converging these lines. So they're optimizing the software, getting that to, and, and hopefully 21 is gonna be even closer where we get that to, to the point where there is not gonna be much of a difference. So this is our PCIe drive. And then uh, again, SSD, uh, we almost saw those uh, in 19, uh, we almost saw those uh, match each other. So uh, a little bit of discrepancy, a little bit, and we're still trying to understand that true behavior. Um, but again, we think it's a lot with the, the read write speeds, uh, the size of the files. Uh, once that pipeline is big enough, it's no longer a bottleneck. So it doesn't matter if you crank up those uh, read-write speeds to go even faster. If the data can go through, uh, if you've got a read-write uh, speed of three seconds and it only takes the software two seconds to write it, it doesn't matter how fast you make it. Uh, so then we took a look. Uh, we wanted to look uh, year over year. Um, so we took a look at uh, 19 versus 20. Um, 19 being the top line. 20 uh, being the red line, um, and we see that in most instances we are um, running just a uh, just a touch faster, so they are making making improvements year over year. So then I, again, uh, we were very happy to uh, take a look at uh, the virtual uh, cloud center, a brand new offering from Box. Uh, they are getting to roll and getting ready to roll that out here. Um, in the very near future. Um, and they wanted to know this is a big trend, and especially now that uh, uh, we're all uh, being displaced and all working from home and, and uh, kind of our work environments are changing. Uh, this is getting a lot more traction and a lot more, uh, a lot more looks uh, even than it was a few months ago. Uh, so this is a remote workstation um, that we log into much like you do a remote desktop. Uh, but it operates a, a little more stable than that. And they wanted to know, is there any difference between their offering uh, and having a physical hardware uh, on your desk? And we were, uh, we were very thrilled to share with the Box team uh, that our performance uh, was virtually identical to our tower. Uh, so the fact that it's a remote, uh, remote system, they have figured out how to make, take a, tower uh, components and cram them into a little rack mount on a server. Uh, so their, their server grade hardware is now equally uh, as fast as a, uh, a conventional tower. So now we did take some time and we did do some testing on what was it, Advanced, Advanced Server 2000? Yeah, Advanced then, uh, a partner of ours, Advanced 2000. So they, uh, we are they really we are doing some more additional look, yeah, and it does show. The, so we are testing some more virtual uh, hardware. Uh, that is stuff that we've we've continued to look at, um, and I think uh, it, it is looking like it shows. Doesn't matter that it's remote or not. It actually matters what the physical hardware is that they are using. So it matters what CPU they have in their system, uh, how much RAM, and, what video card. And GPU, yeah. So, so we, uh, we're going to continue investigating that, uh, having conversations with them. But uh, um, right now, um, this uh, working on this box system, uh, again, it didn't matter what, whether this is our, our smaller model, the other one was our largest model. Um, didn't matter size of the file uh, across the board. Uh, it, it performed uh, equally as well. All right, a couple more here. Um, the pipeline off and pipeline on. 
Um, so again, just uh, no matter how, how we tried to beat that thing up, um, it, it performed extremely well. So everybody was uh, very pleased in uh, seeing these, uh, these results come. Uh, take a look at, uh, we took a look at uh, simulation, simulation versus clock speed. Um, so Bob and I can uh, constantly try to figure out how we can look at different aspects of the software as well. Um, so most of our stuff is we focus on the everyday user, straight up modeling, large assembly modeling, uh, operations inside the software. Uh, but we know there there are a lot of other ways the software is being used, and a big area that that is uh, simulation. Uh, whether yep. that's plastics, whether that's FEA, uh, whether that's slow. Um, problem we have with this is it, it's a tough thing for us to test. Uh, we cannot just create a generic uh, uh, model um, of parameters uh, to cram at. A, a varying uh, set of uh, models um, yeah. because there's so many parameters, conditions, uh, factors that go into setting up a, a study properly. Um, but what we did see running this, uh, taking this model, running uh, it against the clock speed, uh, is we did get a nice, uh, nice curve there as well. So we do see a uh, nice increase in performance, or I should say, a decrease in overall time uh, but it is a little less uh, um, than what we see in straight up SOLIDWORKS models so we get about seven and a half percent for every half gigahertz so you're right around that 15 uh, maybe 15 to 20 uh, range um, and again when we talk about that that is straight up physical hardware gain um, there's a lot this is always a, a two-sided conversation um, we're looking at the hardware aspect but there's also the, the model aspect and cleaning up your models, optimizing your models, and those two together, we can actually see gains that might even be greater than this. So hard drives, we, we spent a lot of time on hard drives. Um, we, we found that the biggest leap was when we went from the conventional spinner drives to the SSD. Um, it, was, it was tremendous. The, the, the time savings there. And now that we've got these new non-volatile me memory address, uh, express devices, these M.2s, they basically look like a RAM chip, basically are a RAM chip, they're just non-volatile. Um, we should be seeing some interesting performance there. The one on the bottom right is a version 3. It actually has four memory buses in it. That means it's got four direct connects to the express bridge of your motherboard. The one on the left is a new version four, which haven't quite released to the, the full world yet, but it's gonna have eight lanes of processing. So it's gonna be quite a bit faster. Um, uh, at least we hope so. In, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, we hope so. We're going to be working on this with, with AMD probably this summer. Um, they've got some new Threadripper stuff coming out, but we're looking forward to testing some of the, the version 4 stuff. Yeah, so we're definitely going to keep uh, keep our eye on this, and, and uh, everything kind of seems to be in a, in a stall right now with, with uh, everybody getting uh, displaced right now. So, um, But hopefully, uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely excited to see what that can do with us. And uh, it is stuff that, that SOLIDWORKS is aware of now. Uh, we've, we've made them well aware of these results. And uh, so they are definitely, uh, now it's up to the developers to figure out how to utilize uh, some of this hardware that's out there. As you can see there, you'll notice that there's different drive types there. One of those is a Revo. Um, that's actually still an option that you can buy. It was the predecessor to an NVMe drive it was an SSD that instead of having a SATA interface, it actually had a, an express bridge interface. You plugged it directly into a PCI express port on your, your, on your motherboard. But um, we're starting to see the NVMe M.2s a lot more. Yeah, virtually every, every machine that we, uh, we buy, uh, new laptops, they're all, uh, they're all gone to the uh, NVMe. Um, as we said, uh, very, 
very similar performances as how the cell works as a whole. We're probably even going to recommend going NV NVMEs um, because they're going to have benefits with those faster rewrite speeds. Uh, we're going to see a lot more benefits in our system as a whole because, again, we're not only doing SOLIDWORKS. Yep. Uh, so we did a, a reality check, right? So we uh, we plugged these things in and uh, used the, the crystal, uh, crystal disk mark uh, to, to double check our read rights. And uh, certainly that's uh, – we got the values that they are uh, – we're pro proclaiming. And uh, so the, the drives certainly were faster. Yeah. So we, we're at a point at this point in time where we're talking to Solaris about the performance of an MVME versus an SSD on a, on a SATA controller. And the only thing that we can kind of equate it to is having a pipe. Um, imagine your, your SSD on a SATA controller is a four inch pipe and you have enough water to fill a two inch pipe running through that at this point. So it's running pretty quick. Well, with the NVMe, now we have an eight inch pipe, but we still have a volume that would only fill a two inch pipe flowing through it. So it, it shouldn't give us too much more of a speed increase because the files load so quickly because they're so small compared to one or two, three, four gigahertz files. That's what we're we're seeing here is usually the, the data that they're throwing at these these tests is a lot larger than the many times sub one megabyte files that we run inside of SolidWorks. So, but we're as soon as we find out more data, we're going to publish that. Um, it's definitely something that we need to get SolidWorks to give us a more definitive answer on. All right, so. Uh... Looking at our numbers this year, um, comparing the uh, PCI versus the SSD. Uh, PCI is the red line, the SSD is the blue line. So uh, running 2019, uh, 32 gigs of RAM, um, we did see that the SSD was uh, running a bit faster. Um, and this is about, um, I think if we measured that distance, I think we're in about the 5% range. So a little bit, uh, a little bit greater than we uh, we saw last year, um, but uh, we, that's because we got a much bigger uh, data sample here. All right, so here is again 19. Uh, this is with the pipeline off. Uh, you see the overall uh, times uh, came down a little bit. Take a look at 2020 again. Talking about all that op optimization that SolidWorks is trying to do year over year. Um, again, they they're getting these uh, these lines to converge. All right, so again, very uh, in in the overall grand scheme of things, uh, this is negligible. I mean, you're not even going to notice that difference between the between the uh, same thing. Pipeline uh, on, pipeline off, um, very very close to numbers here. So uh, again, 20 uh, 2020 did did optimize is kind of trying to close those gaps. So uh, that's a, a big kudos to to our development team that. Uh, does uh, does heavily focus on trying to make improvements year over year. So GPUs, I, I spent a lot of time on these and it's one of those, how do you, how do you quantify performance of a video card? I mean, is it how many frames per second you can get? How responsive it is? What does it feel like? Um, what's the image quality when, when you're in motion? I mean, all these things I equate to a quality of life as the designer. And for me, it's more about, I want to click the mouse, and when I click the mouse to rotate, I want the stinking thing to rotate. I don't care if it blocks down. Just let me rotate nice and smooth. Let it be responsive. To me, that's mine. Now, Brian, he may think, you know, I really like having 60 frames a second. That's Brian's quality of life feel. That's, that's up to him. So you really have to take into consideration, what are you looking for with graphics performance? Go ahead, Brian. The other thing that we have to take into consideration is, as a human, what can we perceive? Most people can perceive 
Well, if you go to a movie theater, the old the old style of movie theaters, they would actually run the movies at 24 frames per second in movie theaters when they're actually running on reels. They weren't running 30. But you could definitely tell if something slowed down or something, something just didn't feel right. So at a certain point, we have to take into consideration the device that we're running. Well, most monitors, IT isn't paying for us to have high-end 120, 240 hertz refresh rate monitors. If anything, they're getting this little bit bigger monitors. So in this situation, usually 60 hertz or 60 frames per second is what that monitor can output. Now, in some situations, sours can output over 200 frames per second, but we can't see it. Those just become dropped frames, according to the monitor. So higher FPS in most situations can really become overkill. So just something to take into consideration. The other thing that we want to take into consideration when it comes to video cards is rendering. Um, many times, um, tools like Source Visualizer are now taking advantage of the graphics processor unit instead of the central processing unit or your CPU. So this is an example that I rendered a while back inside of Visualize. It looks pretty good. Go ahead, Brian. So when we look at Visualize renderings, you can see here that we've got a Kepler 2200, an M4000, a P4000, a P6000, and an RTX4000. So, give you an idea, the Kepler is about 12 years old, the Maxwell is about eight to nine years old, the Pascal is on, running on two to three years old, and the RTX is about a year and a half. Um, now, you can see the Pascal 6000 there was the king. It took the, less, the least amount of time to render out a 4K image of this but it's also a $6,000 video card. So you have to take into consideration performance versus the money that is going to fly out of my pocket. So here you can see um, if we look a little further, we can look at the performance of video cards. And this was the testing that I ran last year for SOLIDWORKS World on 2019. And you see the RTX 4000 blew the doors off of the P4000, the M4000, the M2000. Um, today, at this point, the RTX 4000 is still my favorite video card for running SOLIDWORKS. Um, it's around, I think, around $750. But it actually, for performance inside of SOLIDWORKS, it runs better than a P6000, which is a $6,000 video card. They've made it so this video card runs extremely well for SOLIDWORKS. The drivers have been optimized, and um, this, that's what this one's tailored for. It really does an amazing job. So go ahead, let's check out the next one here. So you can see here, I also entered into the mix um, the new AMD um, W5500. Um, I will say um, I'm going to follow my sword here. That number for shaded mode is not 140. Um, when I went back to my presentation and I transposed a number um, on my, my output, that's actually 75. So now, the nice thing about that is that W550 card came out in January. It's $350. And in my personal opinion, it performs just as well as a P4000 and a RTX 2000. And those cards are around five to $600. So if you're looking for a good budget card, I would look at the AMD. W5500. Um, if you're looking for a rock solid all around good card, I'd still look at the RTX 4000. Um, one that AMD gave me later on was the W5700. And it performed just about the same as the W5500. They, they, they still have some road to hoe with their drivers, but they're doing well. 
And what did we find? We found that it worked real well in a single mode. Yes. Uh, as opposed to mixed mode rendering. Yeah, it was something I, I went back to. I actually got the AMD development guys on the phone, their, their driver guys, and showed them how much RAM they were using. So I actually recorded RAM usage, showed them how much RAM they were using compared to AMD. I mean, not AMD, but compared to NVIDIA. And um, AMD wasn't leveraging as much RAM as NVIDIA was, but the, um, NVIDIA's performance was much better on that. Um, larger uh, assembly. So they're going to go back and look at their drivers and see what they can do to make that perform a little better. Take a look at that larger assembly here. So this one's the racing railroad with the, the performance pipeline on. And you can see here that in many situations with that RTX, we're above 30 frames a second. And you can see the other cards are a little bit lower. If we go large assembly mode on, with pipeline on, you can see wireframe is actually pretty pretty phenomenal on its performance with the um, display modes like hidden lines, I mean, hidden with shaded, they didn't perform as well. So it's definitely some lessons learned for the, for the guys over at AMD. So definitely watch on the AMD card. Look, uh, we did test a couple of their older generation is the WX3200. And those, uh, uh, even AMD admits, they know that those cards were nowhere near as good as the new W series. So uh, just watch when you're looking at those cards. I did have a customer recently do that. They bought the older generation card. So, um, so we had a good question from David. Um, what are the units on the left-hand side here? These are frames per second. So the higher the numbers in this situation, the better off you are. So we're saying how many frames per second you're getting during pan rotates and zooms. Thanks for clarifying, Bob. No problem. So solar settings. Settings. Uh, yeah, we take a look at uh, some of the very obvious ones, large assembly mode uh, on and off, uh, verification on rebuild, uh, level of detail, image quality. Uh, verification on rebuild. Uh, for a long time, this has been a, uh, a known impact to performance. Uh, what this does when we turn this setting on, it's found under your performance, under the system options, the very top shock checkbox is the verification on rebuild. Uh, this enabled an advanced body checking mode. So instead of just checking the new face against the neighboring faces, it's going to check that face against every face in the model. Okay. So if you have a big model, that's a lot of checks is going to do, and that's definitely going to take longer to check all the faces than it is to check just the four or five neighboring faces. So. I recommend running that, especially right before you release a document. And if you are a sheet metal person, highly recommend running that one as well, um, just to make sure that you don't have any violations of bend lines, that sort of thing. So now, a lot of things with these settings is we are trying to pick apart um, and absolutely scrutinize every setting in the software. Uh, a lot of these end up being give and take, right? So if I can live with a little bit of loss of overall performance, I'm in, and my personal preference is to leave this setting on. Um, I do know that takes off my top end performance, but I know I get a, a much more thorough checking when I'm modeling. Uh, looking at fully resolved model with verification on re, uh, rebuild turned on, okay? We saw, um, a nice significant drop here. And very interestingly, no matter what model, that equates out to a minute, 30 seconds. And I just had this come up in a support case and uh, they reported the same thing. Turning, uh, turning off the verification is gonna add a minute, 30 seconds to your overall time. Not sure why, uh, why it consistently becomes that number, but that, uh, that is the number we are, are calculating here. Level of detail. Uh, level of detail is controlling our frames per second. Right? So it is uh, setting a goal. 
So this setting is found under, again, under performance. There is a slider of uh, tick marks. Uh, if we turn it all, move that slider all the way to the left end, we turn off the frames per second. That very first tick mark, it is trying to achieve one frame per second when we rotate. If we take that all the way over to the right end of the slider, software is trying to hit 20 frames per second. So that's its goal. So uh, it, it could stop before that if it achieves it, but it, its goal is trying to reach 20 frames per second. When you start seeing files block up or level of detail disappearing as you try to pan, rotate, and zoom, that's what this setting is. Now, with, with all this being said, after we started doing our testing, we found out that when you go into the performance pipeline, this setting doesn't even work anymore because the performance pipeline does not use this at all. So traditionally, they, they stopped us at 20 frames per second. That's the maximum we could achieve. Pipeline, we're turning that off, and we're just saying, let it do whatever it can achieve. And a, a small side note with that is, if you're running with pipeline off and you're in large assembly mode, you would notice that in large assembly mode, it would block up. And the, the goal for large assembly mode is actually 14 frames a second. All right, so we, uh, we ran uh, um, some uh, data through there, uh, trying to look at different percentages, see what that curve was. And uh, as we went uh, along, we see that nice uh, gradual increase as it's trying to get that 20 frames per second. Image quality slider. This has become a, a big focus. Um, this is controlling the graphical triangles required to create a CAD model. Okay. So this has a direct correlation into the number of graphical triangles. So a graphical triangle, if you're uh, familiar with a, an STL mesh file, uh, is very similar in nature. Uh, it kind of triangulates our data, and that's how the video card shows it. So moving this uh, image quality uh, higher, further to the right, decreases the deviation, which makes a smaller, tighter mesh. So if I go all the way up to that right end, into that red zone, actually those little black triangles, uh, we'll get a message uh, that tells us uh, sliding this into the red zone will increase uh, the file size, and we're talking exponential file growth. Uh, it'll cause the graphics performance to be slower and substantially increase memory, memory usage. Okay, so despite SOLIDWORKS giving us a nice big warning here, uh, we are finding many, many, many people still sliding their files all the way into this red zone. Okay, so uh, we, uh, we took a look at this, uh, changing the level of detail from 95% uh, down to 20%. 20% is probably what we deem our, our optimal. Um, that is right in between that third and the fourth tick mark from the left end. Okay. And just by doing that, uh, we get a, a file size decrease, um, and we actually saw an 18% improvement in opening time. Yep. And, and the scale on the left-hand side is number of seconds to complete. So you're looking at about 325 on the right and about 395 on the left. Okay, so large assembly mode. Uh, large assembly mode uh, defaults, uh, SOLIDWORKS defaults that at 500 components. Um, so as soon as you cross the 500 component threshold, SOLIDWORKS kicks in the large assembly mode by default. Uh, it's going to hide sketches, planes, axes, reference geometry. Uh, it's going to turn off the real view graphics. Uh, it's going to load your component lightweight. Right? And as Bob mentioned, it's going to set that target frame rate to 14. So looking at large assembly on versus off uh, was very interesting here. Uh, when our model MDO1, 2, and 3, again, those are um, about a 1,500 component assembly. So large assembly definitely kicks in, 
but we didn't really see that much overall uh, impact to the model until we actually got into the large, large model uh, files. Um, as soon as we got up into that 15, 20, 30,000 components, uh, that is where we saw the significant drop in overall performance. Now, with this, your mileage may vary based upon what hardware you have. Um, depending on the hardware you have, maybe Model 1 is the large assembly for your system. So at a certain point, each machine is going to have its kind of its threshold of what a large assembly is. Absolutely. All right, lessons learned. Well, I think the first one, uh, this pipeline is still pretty awesome. Um, it's it's uh, really makes those large models uh, rotate, zoom, pan uh, much, much smoother. Um, and with the recent conversations with the development team, uh, that is, is a high focus into getting that optimized. Um, and they're still trying to figure out where that, uh, where that uh, best optimization point is. Um, we learned very early on, uh, always check your graphics drivers. Um, they do cause uh, momentary panics, um, but that is, uh, that is definitely a message from us as tech supports. We always need to make sure drivers are up to date. Now that actually has changed. A lot of you uh, have been using SOLIDWORKS for a long time. SOLIDWORKS used to put out a very sp uh, specific, uh, specified driver for your car. Um, and they've kind of changed their philosophy on that, working with uh, the NVIDIA and AMD development teams. Uh, they are now, um, they've been holding weekly meetings, um, weekly and bi-weekly meetings um, to, uh, to optimize the uh, overall performance. So uh, that is to stay up on uh, the latest bug fixes. So the new new message, new practice is that they want you to stay with the latest, greatest um, driver. Uh, most importantly, there is always a bottleneck. Okay, throughout this testing, Bob and I go off of lots of little tangents. That's where we're a little dangerous on that. Uh, we like to. Um, study things and when we see something we're little squirrels uh we uh little dogs chasing squirrels uh as soon as there is something for us to uh, focus on we dig deeper and uh so that means that that bottleneck moves yep it, it definitely does and no matter no matter what there's always going to be a bottleneck as soon as SOLIDWORKS addresses one area that means the bottleneck is just going to move to another area uh, and as I said, Bob and I are always, uh, always looking for other things to test. Um, so we're never satisfied with the data we've got. We always want to dig deeper. Um, this year, we, uh, last year we focused uh, heavily on uh, pivot tables to get through our data. Uh, we said uh, we've, we've collected well beyond the, uh, the amount of data that that can handle. So we we focused into Power BI. Uh, so analytic tools to help us uh, understand the trends. Uh, we are continuing uh, to look at that, to dissect uh, our data, um, to give you guys the best information that we can. Um, and who knows if, uh, if Power BI will be the end tool. We're always looking to find, uh, find the best way to dissect this data. Well, yeah, and we're, we're, we're constantly looking at new things to automate. Um, I'm in the process right now of writing a API to um, automate the testing of simulation products. And um, we're also, I'm constantly, we talk about image quality slider. I'm constantly writing macros to edit, develop, and change image quality settings in, in assembly files. So there's, there's things that we go out and we try to develop to make our lives easier when it comes to helping you guys. Um, and as, as we get that information, we, we like to share it. Um, things that we're, we're really excited about would be, I mean, if, if anybody's watched the world of, of processors lately, AMD's got processors out that have 36 cores in them right now, which is kind of crazy. And the fact that we're like, well, we, we can only, I mean, there was a question that popped up and said, well, doesn't SOLIDWORKS only use one core? Well, for primary, almost 
everything inside of SOLIDWORKS is a single threaded process. But there are some things that are that can be multi-threaded. So a great example of that would be going down your feature tree and rebuilding from the top down. That is a linear process. You can't really break that apart and let multiple cores or multiple processors work on that. So that has to be linear. But things like loading assemblies, um, loading multiple components, rebuilding configurations, those could all possibly be multi-threaded things. Um, from what we found over the years, SOLIDWORKS itself right now doesn't really take advantage of more than four cores. So if you're looking at a processor, you really want to look at a CPU that has the fastest clock speed you can get your hands on, but you don't have to worry about the core count for straight up SOLIDWORKS usage. Now, if you're pretty computer savvy, some people can go in and assign a fit, what they say in a Windows environment called affinity. They can assign certain cores to certain applications, which can, can be good. Um, I know AMD is working on some stuff with SOLIDWORKS now. I wish I could go in depth, but they're, they're looking to get some aspects of SOLIDWORKS to become more multi-threaded. Yeah, so, absolutely. That's a, that's a big focus. Uh, there, is, there is development work there. Um, as we know, it's, it's always that leapfrog game. So yeah. we've got hardware out there that now has, uh, they just keep splitting those cores. Um, but unfortunately, you can't take a straight process, a linear process. Well, the developers have to figure out how to magically dissolve that and then put it back together and keep it linear. Yeah. So I don't know how, how they're going to do that black magic. I'm hoping they do um, because uh, they got some wicked smart people doing the, doing their programming. But uh, that's, uh, that's what we're uh, hopefully uh, uh, going to see uh, in, the, in the upcoming years. So they've been working on multi-threads in, in 2009, you say, David? Yeah, I mean, um, they, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, as soon as, yeah. soon as multi-thread was there. It's just yeah. we've got tw a 20, uh, almost a 30-year-old program. Um, it, it's it's a lot of code to try to figure out how to how to yeah. rework. It, it, it so. sure is. Um, it, it sounds so, easy. It sounds easy. Yeah. It sounds like we should be able to do it. But so I mean, the other thing that we've been working on is with um, Intel. Um, Brian, did you you got that piece of hardware from Intel, haven't you? No, that got uh, that got delayed. It got delayed. delayed. Okay, the, the like two days before all this stuff went down with social distancing and everything, Intel was supposed to be sending us a very high-end machine that had persistent memory modules in it. And persistent memory is basically RAM modules that become a hard drive. So imagine being able to load a file on the RAM and have it direct connect to the CPU with ever having to load it again. So you might have a file that might take you two minutes to load from an SSD or an M.2, but may open in two seconds off of persistent memory. Now, that sounds pretty awesome, but right now it's only in Intel servers. So you have to buy a motherboard that has multiple sockets, um, it's it's made for a server right now, but we're going to be testing it to see what kind of application persistent memory, and that's what it's called, persistent memory, is going to play in our realm. So that's something we're going to be testing probably this summer. Um, that's absolutely. This is, this was a real fun uh, a year at World, uh, talking with in, Intel, talking with AMD, talking with SOLIDWORKS. Um, they're talking directly. SOLIDWORKS is talking with those guys on a regular basis, and now we're just getting kind of in the in the circle of the communication. And uh, we're you're definitely uh, we always are watching for the latest, greatest uh, new stuff. Um, and we want to be the the guys out there putting this, this kind of data out there um, so that you guys know what to expect. So now I I just got a message from. Um, was it Rich Pettit over at Box? That that service, that cloud service, is up and running. They don't have a landing page for it right now. You just need to contact Box directly. 
we're going to have some uh, marketing stuff going up very, very soon. So slightly off topic, but what about Intel UHD graphics? Um, well, the, the, the problem with that is it, it just doesn't meet the certifications that, that Solaris is asking for. Um, the graphics just aren't strong enough yet. Uh, that's another area we know Intel is working with SolWorks, but yeah. um, it just yeah everything that we've seen just it just does not cut it. So, so um, at this point, we don't advise Microsoft Surface. If you check on the SolWorks website now, Microsoft Surface is no longer a certified device, and that's because they have the UHD graphics from Intel in there, um, and they they just they don't. They don't cut the mustard. Oh. But I, I, I apologize, Brian. I think we've gone about 15 minutes over time, but it seems like everyone else is still here. So um, quick, quick absolutely. Here. We've, we've mentioned it a couple times. CPU is king. The faster the process you're going to get, the better off you're going to be with SOLIDWORKS. You don't have this to have more than four cores. Yeah, this is the uh, the biggest bang for your buck. Yep, uh, biggest bang for the buck. Focus, focus on your CPU. Yep, F focus on getting the proper CPU for that. SSD versus M.2. Almost every machine we've seen lately has an M.2 in it. I would stay with that. Um, I would look more along the lines of a 512 instead of a 256. It gives you a little bit more wiggle room with your OS and some of your programs. Um, it's, it's going to be an area that we keep focusing on, every, especially with the new generations coming. Hopefully, we'll see uh, uh, more yep. of a differentiator there. I, I personally really enjoy that RTX 4000. It's one of my favorites. But uh, that, 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 w, uh, that W5500, uh, not too shabby either. So I think that's a card that's going to, going to definitely uh, stay in the game. So, so um, performance pipeline works on pretty much any video card from NVIDIA from Kepler, which is 12 years old, um, verification on rebuild and large assembly modes uh, make the biggest impact on, on performance. Definitely check settings in your templates. That's one of the things we didn't, we didn't talk about. Um, many times we'll go through people's assemblies and we'll find that almost all their part files, their, their level of detail slider is set to 75, 80%, 90% of that slider to the right. And because that template, if you look at a new file, you go file new, then go to Docker and properties, you'll see it's coming from the actual company template. So those templates need to be updated if that's a problem. Um, One of the things I do want to point out, if you look at any of those graphs on this presentation, um, this question comes up a lot. What, what settings do I set? If we look at the uh, SW101 uh, settings, those are the SOLIDWORKS default settings in every scenario, every test we ran. SOLIDWORKS has optimized those settings. Those ran the fastest out of everything. Every time we change the setting, one setting from the default, it increased the overall test. So we do thank uh, everybody for taking their time today.